Uh, let's see if we can get into the Word then. Um, open in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. And uh, we, we are going to get into it today. You ready? Can I, can I make a point of confession to you for a second? Um, I've been preaching in front of people in two and a half months. So uh, you do me a favor if you say amen a lot, um, but only at the good parts. Amen. Okay, there we go. We haven't even done that yet. Okay, um, let me ask you a question. What comes to your mind when you think about fire? It's quite a transition, isn't it? Let's talk about fire for a second. What comes to mind? Maybe ouch, maybe uh, heat. Uh, for me, when I think about fire, I, I think of some good memories. I think of some bad memories, right? I, I think of uh, camping trips with friends. I, I remember a camping trip I took not too long ago where we were with some friends. Uh, Pastor Danny was with us, and he got his guitar out, and we ended up rickrolling the entire campsite with his acoustic guitar. If you don't know what rickrolling is, we'll get you at some point. Um, but, but I, I remember that, that was around a fire pit, right? And so I, that fire and that kind of sing-song gathering, that kind of sticks out in my mind, making s'mores with friends. Uh, I, I remember a time when I was a kid and my brother and I went to a friend's house who lived across the street from us and we almost caught the house on fire. Uh, we were playing with some fire in the backyard and it, it got caught on some brush and it went up the side of the house and we didn't get to hang out with that friend uh, for a while. Uh, I remember when we had just moved over here from the States, if you don't know, I was born in England, and so I, uh, I came over here when I was about four or five years old, and, and we got here to America, and my dad didn't know that we had moved into a desert, and that that meant that fire is dangerous out here, and uh, we had these tumbleweeds in our backyard, and he lit them on fire, and like a good neighbor, one of our people, call, one of our neighbors called the fire department. <laughs> And they came busting in through our house and running into our backyard, and they're like, uh, you can't do that. And he's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize. Uh, so my dad almost burned down Palmdale when we first moved here. Uh, I, I think about fire, and I think about our annual candlelight service that happens on Christmas Eve, right? And you know that moment where we turn off the lights and we all lift up our candles and we say, we're going to be the light of the world, and we're going to share the light that Jesus gave us with the people around us, right? I think about fire, and I actually kind of a newer memory of, about fire is I, I think about this candle that gets put on a table uh, in Cannon Beach when I go up to, to Cannon Beach for school. I, I'm in a doctoral program right now, and, and uh, I've got two more retreats up to Cannon Beach, uh, which, if you don't know, is where they film some of Goonies. Um, and and I, so I, we go up there, and there's this retreat house that we stay in, and, and at the house, our director of the program in this spiritual formation program that I'm in, she calls us to prayer before all of our gatherings in the home, and this happens three times a day, and she takes the candle and she lights it, and she told us the first time that we went up there, it was about a year ago, she said, when I light the candle, everyone goes to silent prayer, and just breathe and reflect on Jesus and think about his presence, and I remember going and thinking, well, I've never done this before. This, is, this felt weird. It felt odd the first time we did it. Well, I, I came home, and this process of going through this spiritual formation doctoral program has been changing me, and it's been doing a lot of amazing things in my life. And I, 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 so I went back up for the second, beginning of the second semester, and it was weird. When she lit the candle the first time, our, when our director lit the candle, I began to cry because I didn't realize that this fire had become a monument in my life that had marked when I began a journey to the first measurement point of the journey, which was the first to the second semester. And I felt like I was a different human being from the first time I saw that fire to the second time I saw that fire. It was like this candle was ushering me on a journey, and I'm going to go back up this fall, and I'm going to be a different person that time. And this candle continues to invite me to pro progress and go deeper in my journey, in my own spiritual development. And that got me thinking about another person, in fact, a biblical character named Peter, who had some encounters. In fact, he went on a journey of progress with fire. And I thought, you know what? On Pentecost Sunday, there is no better day that I can think of to talk to the church about fire, and specifically Peter's relationship with fire. 
So in order to tell this story to you today, we're going to go to three places in the Word of God, and I want to talk to you about the three encounters that Peter has with fire. Spoiler alert, the third one is Pentecost. All right, but we got to talk about the first two in order to get to Pentecost and really understand its meaning. The first fire that Peter encounters, we can see in the Gospel of Mark. If you have a Bible, if you want to open your app, if you've got your Bible open with you, you can go to Mark chapter 14 today. And I want to read to you a chunk of this story starting in the 66th verse of Mark 14. And here is the first fire that Peter has an encounter with. It says, meanwhile, and let's pause there. Meanwhile is while Jesus was on trial at the high priest's house. He's going to go to Pilate's house next. He's going to, he's going to, he's on trial on his way to the cross. Peter has been arrested or Jesus has been arrested. And Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus was outside. And it's so meanwhile, while Jesus was inside, it says Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and she said, You are one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. He went out into the entryway. Then just then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling others, This, <laughs> this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again, now a second time. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. Peter swore. Now, I'm not going to tell you what he said. I, it doesn't record if he actually said a curse word or anything, but he swore. He goes on, he says, I, I'm, I'm not lying. I tell you, absolutely, I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed for the second time, and he remembered that earlier Jesus had told him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And then it says this, and Peter broke down and wept. The first fire that, Jesus, that Peter has an encounter with is what I would like to call the fire of our denial. In order to get to Pentecost, we have to go through the burning of the fire of our denial. Peter was standing outside, warming himself by somebody else's fire, trying to find a way to be comfortable. Jesus, uh, or Peter, was being pushed to admit that he was a friend of Jesus. Peter denied it two, then a third time, and then the rooster crows uh, for the second time after he denies the third time. So the fire of denial is this first invitation on our way to Pentecost fire that is this invitation to allow Jesus to highlight our own sin and brokenness. And I know this might not seem like the thing you were hoping I was going to talk about is your sin and brokenness on our very first celebratory gathering back together or on Pentecost Sunday, but I got to tell you, we don't get to the good stuff unless we go through the fire of denial. We have to come to terms with the places in our own lives where we have been warming ourselves, where we've been finding comfort and peace in something other than Jesus. Pastor Mark, if you're anywhere near, can you, can you help me not sound like I'm ringing a little bit? That's pro it's, I'm fine, but it's probably bothering some other folks. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Say thank you to Pastor Mark. You can't see it online, but Pastor Mark is hustling right now because he's so amazing. All right. Let me make it practical for you. Okay, the fire of denial. What are the places in your own life where you would, would have comfort over commitment to God? What are the places in your life where you would have comfort rather than commitment to God? And I know it sounds insane for people to have gone to this much length for us to be at church today, watching online or getting them and being here today, and, and for us to be in this gathering and to say, what are the places where you're denying Jesus? And yet, I have had to come to terms in my own life on many, many occasions with a place where I realize, oh, I'm pursuing comfort over commitment. And I think all of us need to go through the fire of denial. In fact, I would say I don't think we get to move on to the next phase until we really allow this fire to singe something in our hearts. I heard one time that a person said that you don't get to the healing of the cross unless you spend time with the tears of the cross. See, fire reveals our brokenness. It reveals our pursuit of comfort. 
Fire also has this interesting thing that happened to Peter in this moment where fire allows us to see one another's brokenness. You ever been in a dark room and, and then someone turns on the lights and then you realize the person you're looking at like has messed up hair and you can see how they're all disheveled, but you didn't know it until the lights got turned on, right? That's how Sharon looks at me every morning. She sees me, the lights get turned on. She goes, whoa, right? For the record, when I see her every morning, it's, ah, oh, you woke up like that. You look so great. But there's something about fire. There's something about, about, this, about the fire of denial that actually allows us to see the brokenness in the world as well. And we have to be very careful because a lot of the church, we have this problem because we're still humans when we become Christians. And we have this issue that we, we have our own encounter with the fire of denial and we come to terms with all of that and we give all of our lives over to Jesus and then we become super judgmental because we can see our sin and then we can also see everybody else's sins and how they don't match up with Jesus and then we have this issue where we go oh the world is a terrible place thank God that I'm good Jesus told a story about a guy one time who came and he he was worshiping God uh, at, at the altar and he was wailing and grieving and he was just this lowly beggar of a person before God saying I'm so not worthy and then there was this fair see this kind of do-gooder of religious standard standing over here and he's like god thank you that i'm not like that crazy person over there he's totally messed up that's a great image of how we behave when we refuse uh, to have grace when we can see the brokenness in the world see peter had an encounter where he was where his brokenness was revealed by somebody else and I'm saying this to you because I don't know that there's ever been a time where I have been alive where I can see the brokenness in the world around me more than I can see it right now. And you know what I've noticed is that there has been a massive temptation for us to go, oh, brokenness, brokenness, there it is. I see the brokenness. I see the brokenness. Brokenness. What you, what you said, I'm going to comment about your brokenness. I'm, I'm going to like this. Because that talked about their brokenness. Got quiet. Got quiet. Are you still with me online? I made these people quiet. We've never needed to come through the fire of denial and be honest about brokenness like we needed in 2020. But the beautiful thing is that the fire of denial allows us to come to terms with our own sin so that we can be a helper when we see the sin of the world. You see, the fire of denial doesn't light up the sin of the world so we can judge it. The fire of denial lights up the sin of the world so we can love them. And if you need a biblical standard for this, read the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel was a prophet, and he was living in the Babylonian captivity, and he saw the people of Israel living in sin. They were, they were inspired by the sin in the world around them. And Daniel looked at all of this, and even though he was a righteous man, and he never committed the sins that the people of Israel were committing in that time, he went into his room, he got down on his knees, and he repented on behalf of a nation that was committing sins that he was not committing. The fire of denial should bring us to a place where we are humble about our own behavior. Like Peter was humbled. It says he was grieved and he wept. That is a sign of repentance that we come and we say, God, I am not worthy to be in your presence. And I can see how the world around me is not worthy to be in your presence. And so I repent of my brokenness. And I also repent of the brokenness of a country that for years since its founding has struggled with things like prejudice and hate and racism and empty religious practices that don't value genuine relationship with Jesus. You don't get to the good stuff without repentance. And for too long, we've invited churches to come and have a party. And we didn't go through the process. It's time to repent. And maybe you are sitting here today and you're going, but I'm not a racist. Thank God we need more of you in the world. But did you know that repentance looks like saying, I might not have done that, but we have done that. And so I repent. And I will do the work. For the record, that's called being an anti-racist. You might not feel like you're a sinner today, 
You're wrong. (laughs) So we repent for the things that we know that we've done. We repent for the things we see other people do. Because if you're not willing to pick up the feeling of what has happened that is brokenness, there is no authority to minister to it. Paul said that Jesus became sin so that we could be righteousness. And he didn't just do that to take all of our sin from us. He also did that to set a model that we would pick up the grief and the pain and the brokenness and yes, even the sin of others and bring it on their behalf if they won't to God. Even on behalf of a broken nation that is in love with a political spirit. And in love with hate. And in love with being right. And in love with selling a system. And all it costs you is your soul. And your commitment to a worldly system that you already know won't work. Sidebar. I recognize November's coming up. If you vote, vote. This sermon isn't about don't use your vote. This sermon is about don't sell your soul for a solution that will fall short. Amen? Amen. Don't pursue comfort at the cost of your commitment to God. This might be a good point to tell you that I'm going to be scrolling through a lot of my notes today. I wrote this sermon in February. I had no idea how relevant it would be when God downloaded this word to me three months ago. So I'm scrolling a little bit. Because this isn't just in here, it's, it's like in here. All right, so we're just, I'm just trying to talk to you from, from, from what God's been talking to me about for several months. We need to come to the fire of our own denial. We need to confess for our sins, and we need to be like Daniel and confess for the sins of a nation. And then we can come to Peter's second encounter with fire. Peter's second encounter with fire came after he had denied Jesus. He was broken, he was grieved. He, he felt bro- broken in his relationship with Jesus. In fact, he was so dejected that he left all of his uh, plans behind and he went back to his old job of being a fisherman. And we pick up his story in John chapter 21. In the Gospel of John, Jesus has been resurrected by the time we get to John chapter 21. And Peter is out with, a, with, uh, with John and maybe a couple of the other guys and they're out fishing on a boat. And they're out on this boat And suddenly they hear a voice calling from the shore saying, cast your nets on the other side. And something about this seems really familiar. John, who uh, refers to himself in the Gospel of John that he wrote, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. If you ever write a book, you get to say that about yourself. And so John says to Peter, he says, hey, look, it's Jesus. And as soon as Peter realizes that it's Jesus on the shore, He sort of freaks out. In fact, let me read it to you. It says, when Simon Peter, this is John chapter 21, verse 7. It says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he he put on his tunic, for he had stripped it for work. And then he jumped into the water and headed for shore. He was desperate to be near Jesus. The others, they stayed with the boat. And they pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. And listen to this, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Jesus says, bring me that, some of that fish that you caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now, there's a whole sermon in that sentence alone, but we won't get into it today. But ask yourself sometime what the significance of verse 11 is. Let's go on to verse 12. It says, now come and have some breakfast, Jesus says. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them bread and the fish. You see, Peter had denied Jesus at a fire. He was warming himself over comfort, and he didn't want to sacrifice that at the, cost of deny, at the cost of saying he knew Jesus. And what's interesting is that God has a way of bringing us back to the place where we were broken in order to restore us. And this is the second fire that Peter has an encounter with, is the fire of restoration. It's the fire of a conversation where Jesus reframes his idea about what love looks like. You see, he, he sits down with him and he makes him breakfast. Have you ever made breakfast for a person that you hate? No, you go out to eat with the pe- those people. <laughs> right? You ever like 
made a fire and said, come and sit down with me. Come and have breakfast with me. I made you this meal for someone that you're about to like really lay into. Jesus is already modeling by making a fire here, saying, you remember the last time you and I? Do you remember, do you remember what you did the last time fire and me were involved? You denied me. I'm going to use exactly that moment, the moment that would remind you of shame to burn a new memory into your heart. And I'm going to restore you to relationship. But I love that Jesus doesn't just restore him to relationship with Jesus. He also restores him to ministry for Jesus. In fact, we see that as we read the rest of the story here, starting in verse 15. It says, after breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know that I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Peter's restoration at this fire wasn't just about relationship. It was about ministry. The fire of restoration is for our souls so that we can receive the ministry of reconciliation. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. You see, our job now, because we've been reconciled to Christ at the fire of reconciliation, is that we get to come to terms with our sin and we get to receive the grace of Jesus that would burn away all of our guilt and shame and say, now, take what you're feeling about yourself because of my grace and go and and give it away to others. Feed the sheep. And then Paul says, when he talks about the ministry of reconciliation, he says, go and beg people, implore people, plead with people that they would be reconciled with Christ. Why would he say that? Because you have to know if you've come through the fire of denial and you felt the burning of recognizing that you are a sinner and you've fallen short of God's glorious, perfect, high standard, and yet he still loves you anyway, you are going to want to bring that fire to the rest of the world. Right? So he says, I'm, I love you, but feed my sheep. And now we get to the third fire. We fast forward a little bit. So Jesus has been resurrected. We find out that Jesus actually ends up ascending to heaven. Before he ascends to heaven, though, he tells them to stay in Jerusalem until he says, I send you the Holy Spirit. One of our core beliefs as a Foursquare church is that Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who sends the Holy Spirit to the believer so that we can be empowered. And so Jesus told his guys, hey, don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. And then when we get to Acts chapter 2, this is the Pentecost Sunday uh, passage of scripture, isn't it? We get, to, we get to Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 1, and it says, i got to get used to preaching outdoors, pages keep flipping. It says this, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers, say all the believers. Could you imagine if all the believers that there were in the whole world were like us? Enough to fit in one space, Right? That's, that should tell you something. It's a baby movement. This is a baby movement. It has not grown beyond a one gathering space at this point. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, say suddenly, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm. Not a, not a nice Antelope Valley breeze, but like it's like this calm and then all of a sudden it's one of those like super windy days, you know? where you have tumbleweeds in your backyard, even if you live like 30 miles from the nearest tumbleweed, it still ends up in your backyard. That, that kind of wind, right? Just out of nowhere, indoors, suddenly. Anybody freaking out yet? Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Side note, uh, this was men and women. 
leaders and followers, uh, seasoned disciples and newbies. It says everyone there, right? The Holy Spirit didn't move through the room and check their credentials. The Holy Spirit didn't move through the room and go, hey, uh, what date did you start following Jesus? Because if you could timestamp it for me, we'll determine whether or not you're worthy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. No, he says everyone. That means if somebody just like met Jesus the day before he died, you got it too. You hear it? Everyone. Okay, so now... At the time, as we go on, there were all these devout Jews who were living in Jerusalem. All these people from all over the place came in because they were celebrating a holy festival of Pentecost because Pentecost actually was a, was a Jewish holiday and God used specifically that day for a specific reason that I won't get into right now because I don't have time to tell you all about it, but it was a holy day. And all of these people from all over the place that spoke all these different languages came and they were hearing as these disciples who had just been filled with the Holy Spirit and set on fire by the power of God were speaking in their own language, each of them in a different language, whichever one was theirs. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense, but it was happening. Some of you were like, yeah, that totally makes sense. It's crazy. And in fact, it's so crazy that while they stood there amazed, perplexed, asking what can this mean, because they were hearing these people speak in their own language about the wonders and glorious work of God, some of them, it says in verse 13, in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they're just drunk, that's all. Which is a weird way to explain somebody speaking in your own language while speaking in the language of the other person next to you while only saying one sentence to say they're drunk. You would think maybe I'm drunk if I'm hearing it. Anyway, that just goes a long way to say that when you represent God and when you sometimes, peep, even, even when it's blatantly obvious that God is working, people will still find a way to ridicule it. But let's move on. That's a different sermon. Verse 14, it says, Then Peter stepped forward with the, 11 other, with the 11 other apostles, and he shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Yep. He says, what, This is what was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to say, Joel says this, read it in Joel chapter 2, he says, in the last days I, this is God, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There will be prophecies, there will be signs and wonders, there will be dreams and visions, and that will continue on until the glorious appearing of Jesus to come and, and bring his bride, the church, into eternity. Peter stands up and he goes, guys, that thing Joel was talking about generations ago, this is day one of that. Because the fire of the Holy Spirit had come onto the church. Peter's third encounter with fire actually brought his story full circle. I don't know if you've noticed it yet, but his first fire was the fire of denial. And the third fire brought him from a denier to a declarer of the presence and the work and the ministry and the good news of the person of Jesus Christ. Because he goes on to preach about how, hey, Jesus was here, you guys killed him, but guess what? He rose from the dead. Turns out he was exactly who he said he was. And did you know that thousands of people gave their lives to Jesus in faith and became followers of the way of Jesus that day when the first New Testament church was preached in a world that was falling apart and was set on fire by things like prejudice and broken government systems and all kinds of empty religion. It almost sounds like we need that sermon to be preached today. In fact, I would say that the church has never needed the third fire of Pentecost more than I have known it to be needed today. Oh, I, I could talk to you for hours and hours about all of that, but I, I wonder, can I, can I say some straight things to you? Is that all right? Will you log off if I say some things that are, I've been chewing on this for a while. You guys watch the news this week?
You guys been watching Twitter? Good, stay off that. It's the devil. <laughs> you guys lose any Facebook friends this month? The fire of Pentecost was never about building a church that knew how to gather really well. The fire of Pentecost was about sending a church that knew how to make disciples. You see, Peter had a problem. He couldn't even, at the first fire, articulate that he knew Jesus. By the time he came to the third fire, when he had been restored by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit, he suddenly was the best orator the church had. He stands up and he preaches such a good message that 3,000 people have been saved. I'm going to Bible college now for the third time, and I, I'm not preaching that good. And maybe that goes to tell us something. It's not the education, it's the filling. It's the fire that will change the world. You see, before the Holy Spirit came, there was this misunderstanding and division, and the followers of Jesus were confined in this one space, and it was just them, and they were wondering if when we die, will this movement die with our generation? What do we do next? Because the one we were following is not here anymore, and there's parts of what he said that we genuinely believe, but if I'm honest, I'm a little bit scared, and I don't know that I have the answers for Corona, I mean, for Jesus being gone. But when the Spirit came, suddenly the apostles spoke a language that people of every background could understand. Suddenly they were speaking the language of heaven. They were speaking words that were empowered by God himself. And suddenly, rather than staying in, so indoors with themselves, suddenly, rather than having an introspective perspective, they moved out into the world and they began to fight fire with fire. I've, I've run out of wisdom and tactics and earthly skill and ability. But we can only change the world now if we speak the language of the Spirit. If we learn to speak the language of heaven. If we learn to say the things God would say and not what my flesh would want to say. You see, the world needs to hear the church speak. Words that they can understand about God's love and power. No more Christianese. Let's not come back from coronavirus and our time apart still speaking a language the world doesn't like or understand. Let's not come back from coronavirus being judgmental about the sins of the world because we're broken too. Imagine a church of people gathering on a campus and online, worshiping God together, encountering the fire of the Holy Spirit, and then going out into our jobs and our neighborhoods and our grocery stores and at gas stations and on the street and online on social media and going out to actually speak the language of heaven and not the language of the world. Imagine a church that gave up trying to debate or convince anyone about anything, but spoke wisdom from heaven and spent more energy telling people about the good news of Jesus. If there's ever been a time when the world needs that church to be on that kind of fire, it's now. Peter's journey brought him from denial to declaration. He went from afraid to on fire and bold. To get there, he had to repent, he had to be restored, and he had to be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. We're living in dark days, Life Church. Dark, darker than I, I thought, darker than I knew a couple of months ago. The reality is coronavirus and the, the racial issues and the, Violence happening in the world, the ugly political discourse, none of that started because of this season. The crisis just illuminates what's already there. But the solution is not just the function of the church. The world needs the church to be on fire.
I, I want you to hear this. I celebrate that we're here today. And I celebrate that you're online with us today. The church never closed. We never took a step backwards and we never slowed down. You may never know the impact that Life Church has had during this season when we weren't all together in person, but it was bigger than I was expecting. God has blown me away with what he's done in this season. But the church doesn't need us to come back just for function. We're called to gather, but we need to be on fire. I'm reminded this week of something that God said to his people during a particularly dark time in their history. Fair warning, this is going to sound harsh. In Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, God says, I hate all of your show and pretense. Stick with me. These are God's words, not mine. He says, I hate all your show and pretense, your hypocrisy and your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all of your cho choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. In the message translation, it says, I'm tired of listening to your ego music. When will you begin to sing to me? Verse 24, he says, instead... I want to see a mighty flood of justice, oceans of it, an endless river of righteous living. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, commands that we gather, and all the more as we see the day approaching. We are going to continue to gather, and we celebrate that we can gather, and if you can't be with us physically, you still get to gather. This isn't a message saying that we shouldn't have fought to get back to the campus and we're going to continue to be on our campus. But God is saying that our gathering is wasted if we don't also go to a burning world and fight fire with fire. Yeah. Or as Amos heard it, if we don't go to the world and flood it with oceans of justice and rivers of righteous living. And for the record, justice is not fair, but it leaves no one out. We might not all have the same, but everyone would have what they need. Everyone would get to breathe. Our ministry with the world has to begin with our own repentance. I challenge you. I can't make you do it. I can't make you want to do it. Can I be honest with you? Most of the times I don't want to do it. But our ministry to the world begins with our own repentance and then repentance on behalf of the world's sin and brokenness following the example of prophets like Daniel. This Pentecost Sunday, it is clear that the mission and the ministry of the church is needed more than ever. We must come to the fire of denial and allow God to burn away all of our sin, our selfish ambition, our pursuits of comfort, and ask God to burn away the actions and the silences in this nation that have partnered with the twin demonic spirits of prejudice and racism. We must come to the fire of restoration. And by the way, I mentioned prejudice and racism because those were the ones in the news. Name your own. I know, I know what mine are. We must also come to the fire of restoration. We must hear Jesus ask us if we truly love him. We must face the reality that we have committed adultery in our spirit against God every time that we have pursued any name but his, even if that me means that we must be restored to the purpose of the church, not simply to gather, but to be sent. And from that fire of restoration, we must pray for the fire of the Holy Spirit, and we must pray until we receive the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall on us, to fall on all of Jesus' church, and to fall like he promised in Joel 2 and Acts 2 on all flesh. As we burn with the fire of the Holy Spirit, we must learn to speak the language of heaven in a world that has run out of their own wisdom and methods. We must take this fire in the language of heaven and follow the example of the first members of the New Testament church. We need to be bold to leave the comfort of the places where we have gathered and fight the fires of darkness with the fire of God, the fire of hate and fear with the fire of the love of Jesus. Yeah. It's time for the church to stop waiting for the wisdom of men to resolve the issues of the Spirit. The demonic spirits that divide the human race will not come out if we elect the right person or agree with the right policy or remove the wrong people. These are not man 
unfixable issues. The brokenness of this world can only be healed in the fires of repentance, restoration, and the Spirit of God. And many of them, as Jesus taught us, with fasting and prayer. Only once the church begins to burn the way Peter burned can we have hope to see prejudice, racism, and hate be turned into love and unity. Can we have hope to bind up the political spirit that seeks to oppress and silence the true gospel of Jesus? Can we have hope to lay hands on the sick and see them healed? And can we have hope to see lost, saved, restored, and committed and commissioned by Jesus? Pentecost is the day the church gets called out. We didn't come to gather. We came to get called out. Jesus is on the throne. And his people have the keys to the kingdom. It's time to be filled with the Spirit. It's time to go to the world with the fire of God's love. And I think it's time to pray. As we pray, I want you to realize the theme of the day was that what God wants to do in us, he also wants to do through us. And so can you take a moment right where you're sitting and deal with this fire of denial and come to a place of repentance in your own life? Whether you're here on campus or watching online, can you just for the next moment just have a moment of confession to Jesus? You might feel like, how could I even do that? The list of things that I've done wrong against God is so long. Maybe you could even just begin to say, God, I have fallen short. God, I have failed you. God, I have given my heart to another. I've pursued comfort over commitment. Today, I repent. Repentance means I'm turning from the way I was walking, and I'm going to walk a different way. Jesus, as we repent, show us the new way to walk. Jesus, we repent for our own sins. None of us are perfect and sin-free. We need your love and your grace. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was shed so that we can repent of our sins and have hope for life. But God, we also repent on behalf of a nation that is broken. We repent on behalf of a nation that is short-sighted. We repent on a nation, on behalf of a nation that thinks we are only living in a moment and not standing on hundreds of years of brokenness. And we say, we have wronged you. We have failed you. There are many things that you are thankful that we have done and many that have grieved your spirit. Forgive us, God. We repent for the sin. We repent for our partnership for where justice was twisted by the devil and turned into vengeance and violence. We repent for the ways that we have lumped in all of our authority figures with the bad ones. And we repent for the ways where we have judged the bad ones, forgetting that they too are human and in need of the grace of Jesus. We repent for the ways that we have seen and treated some people as less than human. We repent for the ways that we have left people behind, that we have left people out. And we repent for the ways that when some of us are hurting, we forget that we are all a body. And if a part of our body is hurting, then we are hurting. God, your word says that if we would turn from our sin, humble ourselves and pray that you would hear from heaven and you would heal our land. Heal our land. And God, now we come to the fire of restoration and we say thank you. We say thank you that your love restores, that there has never been a darkness that your fire of love and restoration cannot light up, that there has never been a brokenness that the fire of your love cannot soothe and heal, that there has never been a sin that your fire cannot purge out of our lives. 
We thank you for the fire of restoration that you would love us anyway. Right where you're sitting here or online, can you just begin to say thank you for God's restoration and the grace that he has poured out on your life. You did not deserve it, but he gave it to you anyway because of his great love. Just begin to say thank you to Jesus for his love in your life and the fire of his restoration. And God, as restored people, we receive the commissioning to ministry to go out and share the good news, to feed the sheep, to make more sheep, and to love the world because you loved us. And finally, God, we ask that you would welcome us into the fire of the Holy Spirit, that we would contend for your spirit because we cannot do what you have called us to do without your spirit. We are weak and we are feeble and we are limited, but all things are possible with our great God. And so we ask that you would fill us with your spirit today. In fact, would you even begin right where you're at, here or at home, and begin to ask God, fill me with your spirit. And maybe you've prayed this prayer before, but it's been a hard season. You might not be hurt by just saying, God, fill me with your spirit again. Fill me with your spirit anew. Refresh my life. Refresh my spirit and fire me up. Give me the fire, not for superpowers, but to be empowered to go and share the good news of what you have done in my life with the world around me. And God, we ask that as a church goes out to love the world and fight fire with fire, that you would love the world through us. And that you would do what you did with Peter. That you would turn the deniers into the declarers. And that through our declaration, people would be saved. That you would, through our declaration, love the world. That you would, through our declaration and the power of the Holy Spirit, give us words to speak that the world would understand and that they would receive the love of Jesus. Save people from the fires of hell by the fires of your Holy Spirit burning in our lives. In Jesus' name. And finally, for you watching online and being here on campus, I just want to pray a blessing over your life. And then Pastor Mark's going to come and wrap us up. Jesus, allow me to bless my friends today. That's why I would say to you in the name of Jesus, may your heart burn within you at the pain that your sin causes Jesus. And may that bless you because of where it leads you. May you also grieve for the sins of the world so that you would be moved with compassion to pray for their restoration. And may that bless you for where you get to lead others. May you feel the love and the grace of Jesus restoring you to him every day. May you be filled with his Holy Spirit. May you understand and speak the language of heaven. May you have wisdom that the world will understand. May you be on fire for the lost to see them saved by Jesus. And may you be a unifying force of the love of Jesus in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.